Yeah. All right, good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you for coming out on a wonderful day. I'm sure it's, uh, you don't want to be outside with all the mosquitoes. Yeah. But anyways, um, welcome to our first program of the Lancaster Historical Society. And uh, those of you who are members, uh, hopefully paid your dues. Those who would like some more information and would like to become a member, see Joan over here and uh, we'd gladly take your money. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, uh, first, well, let me go through a few other things here. The executive board of the Historical Society voted for $500 to put towards the restoration of the Herbert Hosmer dollhouses. As yeah. some of you know, yeah. that uh, we got his collection, a, you know, an, an anonymous donor put up the money to buy his collection. And so the Historical Society has it. Some of it's in a little disrepair, so we're trying to get it back up and running again. And it's just very important, you know, that this legacy do, does not disappear from this town. So we just want the approval of the members. Those of you who are members, raise your hand and those opposed. I guess it carries. We also have, there's a GoFundMe page that uh, Lisa sitting over here put together for us. And at this point, we've raised $304 towards buying furniture for the dollhouses and for restoration to get them all up and running. Unfortunately, some of the furniture that were in the dollhouses is long gone and you know gone to the four winds at this point. So in the future, yes. I just so. wanted to say, if you go to the GoFundMe website, search for Hosmer Dollhouse Project. It'll pop up. So if you'd like to donate to this fund, uh, please go there and we would thank you very much and, and to continue this legacy of Her Herbert Hosmer and uh, the Toy Cup at Theaters. I'm sorry, Michael. Sure. Can I add something else? I should have done this. Also, if you go to the Lancaster Historical Society Facebook page, you can go right to the link because the Hosmer Dollhouse Project GoFundMe link is pinned to the top of the Facebook page. So for those of you who are on Facebook, you could do it that way also. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. You know, and the first exhibition in the new town library, which is in the Prescott building, will be a dedication to Herbert Hosmer. And so we'll have the dollhouses set up. So if you have children, mm -hmm. grandchildren, great-grandchildren, <laughs> they would love to see it. And that'll be next year at some point when we can get it all together. Mm -hmm. um, November 11th on uh, Veterans Day, we're going to have a dedication down at the Middle Cemetery, which is halfway down between here and South Lancaster. Some of you may be driven by and there's a big <coughs> granite uh, boulder set into the stone wall and it's going to be a dedication to the Revolutionary War soldiers that served from Lancaster. Um, in the Middle Cemetery there are 43, is it? 37. What's that? 39. 39 <laughs> that served and there are over 700 that oh, yeah. served in the Revolutionary wow. War which is, you know, for a small town being out in the middle of nowhere, that's a great number of people. So there is no marker in town. There's one for everything else, but you know the Revolutionary War, and if it wasn't for them, uh, we'd be singing "God Bless the Queen" still. <laughs> so, anyways, that will be a wonderful affair. We're having uh, Revolutionary War reenactors, uh, a fight. Uh, unit to come in. Um, Harold Norton, for one of the standards, coming for the dedication. Um, the selectmen 
the uh, the VFW here have all been invited, so um, and it'll a direct, be a direct descendant from two Revolutionary War Ooh. men who's in the active in 30 years active Navy is coming to speak on his mm -hmm. wow. ancestors. What so time is all that? Two o'clock on it's, I think it's a Sunday. Yeah. Yes, it, we'll be sending yeah. the invitations mm -hmm. out this week. Okay. So it'll be posted in the paper also. So keep your eye out for it. But it will be Veterans Day, the 11th. Um, beyond that, um, we have Ed Sterling here for our first program. We're very fortunate. Uh, we were talking about programs as to what to do that we haven't repeated in the past. There's just so much history in Lancaster, but you don't want to repeat it constantly because we don't want you to be yawning up here. Uh, so anyways, um, to introduce me to Ed Sterling and you can give him I you know, a little synopsis of yourself and go forward. Thank you. Thank you. So this is about what started as the Massachusetts Central Railroad and became the Central Massachusetts Railroad. Hmm. It has some tangent ties to Lancaster. It didn't actually run through it, but there's enough tangents to make it interesting, I think, for the people in Lancaster, and certainly Bolton, Hudson, Clinton, Berlin, and so on. I've uh, lived in Bolton for 30 years. I grew up in a little railroad town in Vermont called Essex Junction. Uh, had a wonderful train barn, very, very unique big red barn that went over the tracks and it was to shelter the passengers at this junction point. I uh, remember it well as a child. It went down around 1959, something like that. No remnants of it anymore. And I was, I'm old enough that I remember the steam engines. There were still a few steam engines at night that would come from Montreal to Washington and from Washington up to Montreal. Um, uh, wonderful memories, wonderful memories. Um, I, uh, I love Lionel trains. My family always had a big Lionel train layout, and I collect these great big tin, tin passenger cars. It's, it's just a lot of fun. So we were uh, a big sort of train-related family. Um, I call myself a railroad nut. As I drive along, I, I look in the woods, and I can see unusual straight grades that just don't look right. And I go home, and I look at old maps, and sure enough, there was a railroad in there and I wonder, you know, what railroad was that? Why is there nothing left but that grade? Which railroad was that? How did it connect and so on? So that's what kind of got me started with the, uh, with the Central Mass. Uh, and that was the train barn in Essex Junction. Um, this would probably be, well, if you look at the cars, I don't know, maybe, uh, you know, 1951 or something like that. And uh, there's still a train station there, but it's almost like a bank with a little Amtrak office attached to it. It's kind of sad. All that history is, uh, is long gone. Let's try this again. So the reason I care about this subject is that uh, Bolton had its own little one-day railroad that connected to the Central Mass. Uh, again, I, you know, I see these tracks disappearing in the woods. When we moved here, I, I was wondering, what are these tracks running along Route 62? Uh, people said there was a Clinton Tunnel. I couldn't believe that there'd be a tunnel in a town like Clinton. And uh, I just was curious, like, what, what's the story behind this tunnel and the Wachusett Dam and everything else? So I thought it's just a quick background, this, you know, looking at railroads in the 20th century, which is really kind of the golden age, I suppose. Um, I think that you could say maybe the, the first 20 years of the, of the last century were really the, the golden years. It was just uh, phenomenal how many trains there were, famous express trains. Uh, you know, the, the car was just coming into being. Uh, and so the train was still an important thing in people's lives. But Henry Ford comes out with his Model T. And even by 1920, you're starting to see, you know, lots of Model Ts, lots of unusual brands that are long gone. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a huge impact by these automobiles on the rail system, even, even as early as you might say as 1920. Um, the depression comes along and obviously, you know, economically, it hurts business. People don't have the, the money to travel on trains for pleasure. Uh, economy goes down. Many small branch lines 
collapsed. They're, they're long gone, even that early in the Depression. But World War II comes along, and thank gosh there still was a pretty wide you know, network in the country to help the war effort. And so uh, that really was extremely important to the, the effort in World War II. Um, let's see if I can get that. <coughs> so it, it took a terrible toll, the war, on the rolling stock. I mean, locomotives were kind of ground into the, to the ground, if you will. Uh, uh, no time for maintenance. Uh, troop trains you know, <coughs> crossing the country, taking mm -hmm. munitions to the ports uh, from factories all across the country. Um, and so the railroads were really beat by 1946. And the question then was, with all this technology, these new airplanes, the advent of air travel, um, uh, you know, are the, are the railroads going to really revive that passenger service? And a few of them did. There were these uh, famous trains called the Zephyrs out in California, uh, these beautiful vista domed silver cars with these grand two-level uh, domes where you could sit in the observation and so on. And so some of the railroads <laughs> tried to keep that passenger service going, but uh, I would say, boy, somewhere in, in the mid-50s, maybe to the late 50s, the public <coughs> really is now taking airplanes <coughs> everywhere. Nobody wants to sit in a train, you know, for days and days to mm. go from New York to California. So the railroads are really hurt from a passenger standpoint. As well, uh, steam is disappearing quickly in the 1950s. Diesels are so much more efficient. Um, Electric-based cars are making quite an inroad. Our mosquitoes here, <laughs> and uh, it, it's really—it's funny. It's changing everything about the, the national railroads. Economically, uh, the great railroads are starting to collapse. The Penn Central, the New York Central, uh, the combination of the Burlington Northern, the Santa Fe—it's just merger after merger, and finally. <laughs> Uh, about 1970, there's kind of a national meltdown, and we end up with Conrail to deliver freight, and we end up with Amtrak as our passenger service. Okay. So, you know, was this a terminal condition? No. <laughs> the railroads, I think, today are healthier than ever before from a freight standpoint. And this whole idea of these containers from trucks being put on flat cars, what they call TTX, uh, is very efficient from a, from a standpoint of transportation. You put a, a whole bunch of those truck-based containers on a flat car and take them across the country from a cost per mile. It's extremely efficient. And so uh, fantastic advances in technology have helped the national railroads. But passenger service is still uh, mostly a thing of the past. It's there, but it's, it's pretty painful, and it's quite expensive to this day. So, here we have this Central Mass Railroad in the middle of Massachusetts. So why, why would anybody build this? So they start this idea in 1869. We want a railroad in the center of Massachusetts. There's a Fitchburg Railroad up a little higher, up in kind of coming out of Boston into Acton and goes through Fitchburg and goes out to the Hoosick Tunnel. Um, you know, down low we've got rail lines going down into Hartford, Connecticut and so on. But this middle part of Massachusetts was ignored. And so there was a desire to do something about that, to try to give the local economy, the farmers, a way to get their apples and their milk into the city. So your world was you know, definitely limited by your, your horse. I mean, if you think about it, 1869, Civil War is only four years old. Electricity is just a dream in the future. Morse code is there you know, at one railroad station to another, but there's no telephones or anything like that. So isn't this grand to think that a railroad could come into your community and give you a way to get to cities and expand your own world? So very attractive to, uh, uh, very appealing as railroad entrepreneurs came along to say, let's, let's build a railroad in your, in your area. Lines tended, as they say, to run kind of north, uh, north and south like this, and, and there was some limited amount of railroads east-west. So there was this railroad fever, and the thought was, Let's build a railroad from Boston out to Northampton, right through the center of the state. And hence, we have this chartering of a railroad called the Central Mass. And so this was a route map at the time. Uh, they called the Poughkeepsie uh, Bridge Route. And it would go down to Northampton, down through the corner of Connecticut, across uh, the river, Poughkeepsie, New York, get down to Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Washington, and so on. 
And so that was one of the original ideas of how this mass central from Boston to Northampton would connect to the greater part of, of Eastern transportation. Did it make business sense? Well, <laughs> if you look at the center of the state, you know, what were the economic high points? Yeah, there was coming out of Boston, um, Waltham, the famous watch factory in Waltham. All right, now I'm out of Waltham and I'm going through Wayland, Sudbury, um, Stowe. I get to Hudson, finally I've got some factories, okay, as potential freight customers. I can go on to Clinton, the big mills in Clinton. Okay, that's attractive for me. Then as I leave Clinton, a lot of small towns, Amherst, still pretty small in those days, and so finally Northampton. So I think the economic case was fairly weak, but the desire seemed to be there, and they were willing to go ahead with the idea and charter the railroad. Okay. So this was the original route map, and they were starting in Boston, okay, going out this way, Hudson and Clinton, Okay, you take a little dip, we kind of go out to little towns like Rutland and uh, uh, Colebrook, Barry, Belchertown, Amherst, and finally we end up out, out in Northampton. So that was the original idea. Hmm. All kinds of different proposals had come along. <coughs> finally, this Mass Central Charter wins, and the court gives them a charter, and it's capitalized at $3 million. And maybe in 1869, that sounded like a lot of money, but it, it really didn't seem to be quite enough, and it proved to be somewhat inadequate. So they then had to go out to all the towns that the railroad went through and sell shares to get the money to build the railroad. So each town was approached, and selectmen had to look at this, and boy, $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, I think Berlin was asked to contribute. So it took a long time to, to twist arms to make this happen. Well, finally, they did get enough money, they started building, and they came out from Boston, and they got to Hudson in October of 1881. So 1869 is the idea. 1881, they finally reach Hudson with plans to go to Northampton. Hudson's about, oh, I think 30-some miles. Northampton's 104 miles. They have a long way to go. They continue on to Little Jefferson down here in Holden, if you've ever been to the outskirts of Holden, there's a little cute little village called Jefferson, and that's where the building stopped and they went bankrupt in mm. 1882. Oh, all that effort <laughs> for naught. Well, again, there were still believers in this. So they reincorporate a year later, get some more money, um, and they start the railroad operation again. And so in December of 1885, four years later, they're back out to Little Jefferson, no further ahead than they had been, but there's more money behind them. And the famous B&M, the Boston and Maine Corporation, one of the major railroads, comes <coughs> along and, and decides to lease what they had so far on the Central Mass. And now there's more money, and they finally get out to Northampton in 1887. 104 miles. Right. Took 18 years, quite a, quite a long time. Right. So that's the route map once the BNM got hold of it. There again is Boston. There's a crossing with the old colony, became the New Haven Railroad in Sudbury. Okay. They're out here in Oakdale with some junctions here into Clinton and going up to Air. Oakdale, they keep, now you can go down to Worcester if you want it. Now you continue down to Little Jefferson, uh, Barry, Hardwick, Ware, and finally out to Northampton right there. And that was the announcement of the railroad being open all the way. It says December of 1887. So the B&M comes along and sort of finalizes their control. By 1902, they've got all the stock. And the Central Mass Railroad ceases to be an independent. It becomes a division of the B&M. And there were divisions all over the Northeast. Too many little railroads. It's 1900, and all this railroad fever from about 30 or 40 years ago, it pretty much died down, and the B&M is controlling almost everything. There was another big one called the Boston and Albany down in Hartford. There was the uh, New York, New Haven, and so on. You can spend all day analyzing the history of this. There's a wonderful gentleman named J.R. Green, and he's very prolific on things uh, about sort of the Quabbin and uh, 
from this area going out west. And so he wrote this uh, very interesting uh, book called uh, The Mass Central Quabbin's Phantom Railroad. He's kind of a Quabbin expert, so I think he worked that into the title. But this has excruciating details on uh, the history of how the whole thing got started. This is the book that a fan would really want. And this is the one I found in the Bolton Library. It was one of these, you can't leave the library with this book because it's too valuable, all right? But the librarian was very kind, and uh, I did get very good access to it. And uh, it was published in 1975, fairly limited edition, uh, by the Boston and Maine Historical Society. And it's unbelievable, the quality of the photographs that you know, people thought to take in those days. Uh, the history of the railroad, it's astounding. So, I went on quite a search for that book. It has been reprinted once or twice. Absolutely. In fact, uh, there it is right there. <laughs> so yes, I think I dropped about $150 at one point. Just had to have it. And uh, 1982, long-awaited update with many extra photographs and, and more history. Uh, and uh, that second edition is uh, now available for about $35. Uh, wonderful, wonderful book. And most of my research was based on going through these two, uh, these two books. All right, so there again, just kind of a picture of our, of our you know, railroad, uh, the official railroad map with all these little tiny stations. Um, let's see what it'd be like if we, we took a ride on that train. So up until the 1930s, you would have had an old steam engine. They were fairly small <coughs> in this area. They were not the big giants that you saw sometimes uh, out west. Uh, weight probably had a lot to do with it. And just economics of why would you need a giant locomotive with you know, four wheels on each side and able to you know, take a hundred cars. They didn't need that. They needed something efficient. So they called them moguls. It was just a nickname. They had two little tiny wheels in front by the cow catcher. They had three wheels on the side called drivers, and there was nothing underneath the engineer. They didn't need a sort of a back wheel. So they called it two, six, zero, in indicating the wheel alignment on the locomotives. Um, the engine numbers in those days were from the 1300 to 1400. So later on, we'll see pictures of engines with those, those numbers. And there's a famous engine that uh, took the last ride out of Clinton and it's in a historical museum right now, old number 1455. Right? Passenger cars would have been kind of a rusty red color, <coughs> like a Pullman. As technology changed in the 1930s, they took passenger cars and refitted them with engines and a cab in front, they called them a doodle bug. Mm -hmm. And it was a self-propelled passenger car that again was very efficient. You didn't need the locomotive, you didn't need the fireman, you didn't need the coal and the water. So from a transportation efficiency standpoint, it made a lot of sense for a small run to go out to Clinton. All we needed was some passengers and maybe you know, a bicycle and a couple of crates of apples or whatever they were doing. These little doodle bugs would, would be just fine on a short, a short run. Later on, in the, in the early 50s, what they called bud cars, these very pretty silver cars with kind of an engine uh, up, up on top, uh, a big uh, exhaust fan and so on, um, the bud car, the RDC, replaces the old-fashioned doodle bugs from the 30s. And uh, even when I moved here in 1987, uh, the MBTA was still hauling these old uh, RDCs that I think had ceased running by themselves, and now an engine had to pull them. And oh, they were oh. filthy. <laughs> they were dirty, and they desperately needed replacing. So now we have the you know silver and purple cars that you see on the on the MBTA. I think the other factor was out in Clinton. There was this narrow what they call viaduct, a trestle that uh, was pretty rickety and probably wasn't going to take more than a, a nice little uh, mobile engine. It, uh, it was not going to stand up to the weight. So. Again, we're taking a trip on the line. Uh, if we're back in the late 1800s, uh, this would have been the type of engine we would have seen, uh, called a 440, four wheels in front, and uh, four big uh, drivers, two on each side. Uh, very period-looking engine, very quaint. And uh, there's one of our moguls going into the 20th century, and lasting until about 1956. And again, this idea of two, and then Six is three drivers, and again, the 1300 and 1400 numbering. Okay. Yeah. There's a typical doodle bug, a morning style paint job appropriate to get people off the tracks. A little uh, cargo door here, bathroom, and passenger, passenger compartment. And they were uh, gas 
gasoline powered to an electric engine underneath the, to drive the car. There's one of our Bud RDCs, lasted a long time. I believe there's one on display in Bedford, the Bedford terminal off 128 there. They were able to acquire one and it's on display with their restored uh, it's terminal. It's Depot Park. Depot Park, thank you. Yeah. Those are diesel. Uh, yes, that's on my understanding. Rail diesel car, yeah. RDC. Smell like crazy. <laughs> they, did, they did not have electric generators. They were those ones, okay. Uh, okay. All right. So, um, you know, if we took the train today, uh, if it was possible, it's kind of surprising. Until recently, and my, my presentation can't be modified fast enough, um, the, uh, at one point when I started this whole thing, the tracks were intact. And the rail trail activity around here is crazy. It's unbelievable how much money apparently is available. Uh, up in uh, Chelmsford, going down to Carlisle and to Acton. They're going through the middle of Concord now. And even in uh, Weston, which had violently objected to any idea of a rail trail, they have now torn up the tracks and they've paved it. And to some extent, the electric company is a factor in all of that, saying, uh, we need our trucks to drive down the power lines, which were side by side with the uh, rail. And so. That's where the rail trail is kind of being improved uh, in, uh, in Wayland and West, in Weston. Um, here and there, uh, you know, companies have uh, just kind of ignored the fact that there was a right of way and uh, they just built buildings on top of it and they've parked all kinds of trucks. And little overpasses have been all taken down and so on. But fundamentally, the, uh, you know, the route is still, still pretty much intact. Uh, and probably most importantly on 128, the bridge that they built is still very much intact and in very good condition. So if they decide to have the rail trail go from Waltham all the way out here to Clinton or beyond, uh, they've, got a, they've got a way to cross one of the <coughs> safely. One of the problems right now is Route 2 in Concord. How are they going to get the rail trail going across Route 2 into mm -hmm. West Concord? So apparently some multi-million dollar bridge is going to need to be built. Mm -hmm. okay. So if we start our trip on the Central Mass, we would share some tracks coming out of Boston with the Fitchburg line, yeah. just from an efficiency standpoint and, and the way the agreements were. There was only so many rails that you could you know, lie down in Boston. So, um, so some, rail, some common rail was shared. And then uh, today, at what we would call Waverly on the MBTA line, that's essentially where the, the central mass began, okay? just from the starting point. And these are some of the little stations that went through Waltham. But notice, here's Route 20, which is Main Street in Waltham. The watch factory would have been down here. And this high side of Waltham is kind of devoid of any real industry. So again, Central Mass is looking for customers. <laughs> it's pretty rural back then, and there's not much to go on as far as making money from the good citizens of Waltham, and that was one of the problems. So Waverly, back then, was called Clematis Brook was a little, uh, little sort of way stop, kind of a flag stop. And there was actually uh, the, a little station of identical name on the Fitchburg line, which is the commuting line today, and the uh, long gone central mass. So again, just a cute little, uh, little uh, stop for uh, commuters. There was a parallel track for a while that ran beside the Fitchburg line. And this steam engine is coming into Boston off that parallel track. Eventually, when the Boston and Maine owned everything, they get rid of the parallel track and abandon it. But this was the real start, if you will, of the main line going to Fitchburg, where the central mass broke off on its own. And today, it kind of goes off in the weeds. There it is, curving off into the nothingness of going on the high side of Waltham. And here's our Fitchburg line, you know, going today out to Acton. And is that aimed west? That should be, that should be <coughs> looking uh, west, right, with this track going to, you know, down into Main Street, Waltham today, and the central mass ran on the high side of it, yeah. and that's Beaver Street. Mm -hmm. So we would go off on that branch, we would uh, start through the high side of Waltham, we would cross over Linden Street, <coughs> this bridge, it's still there, it's in pretty good condition, and we would go to what they call Waltham North. And unfortunately, it's long gone, and even there, it's looking kind of sad in 1953. Mm. Uh, pretty much looks boarded up to me, mm -hmm. and, uh, that was the end of that little station, long gone. So very shortly thereafter, a couple minutes later, we end up in Waltham Highlands. And um, there we are again, you know, looking pretty rural, to, to say the least, even 1954. And here's one of our doodle bugs with a little car behind it. 
um, you know, going on the, uh, we're probably going into Boston at this point. And uh, nice little station, but again, not long for this world. Fortunately, it was saved, and it's an insurance company now. And they have all kinds of nice pictures of what the railroad looked like on the side of the building. So somebody really cared to, uh, to keep that, very, very fortunately. So we go through the high side of Waltham, a couple little stations, nothing, no real industry to, to stop and you know, do anything for freight. And we have to cross over what would become, of course, 128. Um, so I had to build a bridge. And uh, I think 128 was built somewhere in the uh, early 50s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the railroad was still operating, of course, at that point. Uh, so the bridge is in good condition. Uh, you'll see various references to YouTube. There's all kinds of people who have uh, gotten their cameras out and they walk down the old track bed uh, photographing what it looks like to this day. So if you're a real fan, you can kind of see these people walking through the weeds and looking at the old tracks and the old switches and the, you know, off on the side. Everything's all overgrown. But it's interesting that where rail fans who uh, have taken the time for these uh, 20 and 30 minute videos uh, section by section of walking down the track. So you can do that in your own living room without getting dirty. <laughs> so uh, going, uh, going over Main Street in Waltham, we follow these power lines uh, starting to reach the bridge. They don't want anybody down there. And there it is across 128. And it's right by the Route 117 crossover. So if you would take 117 into Waltham, and just glance to the south, you'll see the railroad. <coughs> Nothing, no, no, no activity on it today, to this day. And there it is, it's in pretty good condition. There's a truck at the end, and there's kind of a, some kind of a car-related business with trucks and cars that seems to have parked their stuff all over the railroad track. So I guess that'll have to be dealt with if they ever get a rail trail uh, mm -hmm. going here. If we were on one of those RDCs, uh, we would have crossed over 128, and there we are going over a bridge. We're crossing, we on the, the uh, central mass line on our bud car, we're crossing over the Fitchburg line at this point. So that bridge is still there intact, and if you were to happen to look out the window at just the right time, going from Acton into, uh, into Waltham, you would, uh, you would notice that bridge above you. And there it is. So that would be from the Fitchburg line looking up. So the next station we reach would be Weston. And isn't it fascinating to look at all the telephone lines? Mm. It's like every subscriber must have had his own private line in those days <laughs> <laughs> before they understood how to, how to multiplex the telephone conversations. Mm. Um, this, is, uh, this is Church Street. 117 would be coming here. We'd be going down to Route 20 over here. And uh, I guess there was enough, enough problems with traffic in those days, that they had to build a bridge. And there must have been a lot of accidents of the train racing along. So they ended up moving <coughs> the station down around here, and they built a big bridge. And there it is. And that bridge is still there today. Oh, yeah. This apparently is a uh, it's just for trucks. Uh, uh, there was some you know vehicle usage at that point. It wasn't like there was a second train. But you can notice two tracks, which is interesting. It, only one track until recently was, uh, was excellent. Um, this station is still there, and um, it's in pretty good shape, but you kind of worry, what is the owner's plan for it? I, it would be wonderful if they would do something and, you know, build a little train layout inside and make a museum of it of some sort, but it just sits there idle. And uh, let's see, so there it is in 1950, again, looking kind of sad, and 1990, which is pretty much what it looks like today. And this, uh, this right away in here, the railroad tracks have been pulled up. And there's a paved road now, again, for the electric company. And you can see the power line here that mm -hmm. runs all along the tracks for miles and miles. So one of the few stations that, uh, that survived. Weston, for some reason, was against the rail trail until fairly recently. They've changed their mind now. So shortly there, uh, after stopping at Weston, there's a little flag stop, as they call it. You've got to wave the train down at Cherry Brook, and this is Concord Road. Um, that overpass is still there, but the, uh, the little stop is unfortunately long gone. And a lot of these little places just, I guess, got burned by vandals, and sadly, mm -hmm. so that one disappeared a number of years ago. We continue on to uh, Wayland, uh, to what they call Tower Hill. Again, a nice station that uh, has no, uh, no evidence of anything ever being there, except another one of these sad little burned out shells that uh, is long gone. 
my aiming here is not uh, working too well. I'm just going to adjust my little indicator and see if that helps. So again, um, long gone and was demolished um, when all the passenger service disappeared. The next station that is in very good condition is Whalen, right at uh, 120, uh, route one, uh, sorry, Route 27 and 126. So as you come down into Wayland, all right, if you look to your right, if you're traveling south from Maynard, this gorgeous little, uh, very well restored station is still there. It's like a craft shop. And we can see from the picture, this dates back probably to the late 1800s, the horse and buggy. There's a freight coming through in 1947. That's going west from Boston. And it, the freight is actually sitting on Route 27 at this point. Good bunch of commuters. It's 1956, so the, the train is uh, pretty popular uh, you know, with commuters at that point. Um, quite the crowd. But by 1970, thinning out, I think I see about five or six people there. And commuting service, passenger service, would stop the next year, November of 71 was the end of passenger operations on the Central Mass Railroad. And there it is today. Pretty good condition. Very nice little shop. Mm -hmm. There's a very active group in Wayland uh, doing their best to uh, uh, keep the, uh, the railroad memories alive. And I think they're even going to try to dig out the roundhouse. Locomotives used to have to be turned around on a turntable. So I heard that they're going to try to restore the old turntable. Leaving Whalen, just a very short distance, we come to Russell's Garden Center. It's quite a popular garden place on Route 20. Big crowds of weekends <coughs> to this day. And at Russell's, again, from a traffic standpoint, the railroad cut at a very, very long angle. It wasn't a nice T. Very long diagonal. And again, must have been a site of a lot of car accidents. And so they decided to put in a pop-up. I've never heard of anything like this except here. And what it was was some type of a barrier. And when the train came along, this thing apparently automatically came up out of the ground and it said, stop, you know, railroad. <laughs> I guess a lot of people didn't stop. And I think the thing got demolished time and time again. Um, so let's see if we can get a picture of it here. So there it is. The railroad makes this long diagonal cut across Route 20. Wow. Again, sadly today, you don't see any evidence of that on the road, yeah. but out here, there's a big swamp, mm -hmm. and the tracks are just perfectly intact. You would have thought maybe trees would have grown up and, you know, all kinds of little saplings come. No, it's as if the train, you know, was coming through at noon. Um, on this side, there's a big shopping center over here, and again, the Wayland Station is right down this way. So. You can barely see a little stop mm. uh, message coming up, and I guess there may have been something on the other side, but that was the famous pop-up, and it's the only <laughs> one I know of on the whole, the whole line, but a real in interesting railroad curiosity. So just looking at a topographical map, um, here's Boston and here's uh, Clinton out here uh, with uh, Route 20 coming along. Um, there was a little East Sudbury station at Lanham Road, if you ever uh, go down to Framingham, there's a nice little shortcut coming out of uh, Sudbury on 27, and it's called Goodman Hill Road. And if you go down there off of Goodman Hill uh, and cut down south, there was this little station. But sadly, there's a whole bunch of condos being built, and I don't hope they haven't encroached on the, uh, the track, which again could hinder a rail trail. And, uh, and there it is. So again, one of these flag stops <coughs> where a passenger would wave the train down, um, and we can tell by the, the old car there, probably about 1930 time frame, something like that. So again, just following our, our railroad map, um, we leave that station, we kind of go under Route 20. There's a little Millbrook shopping center today. It crosses right there on what they call Railroad Avenue and comes to what was known as Union Station in South Sudbury. Again, Route 20 and Union Avenue going up north to, uh, to Maynard and, uh, and Sudbury, Sudbury Center. So this is the South Sudbury Station and it was called a Union Station because the uh, old colony railroad crossed at that point, going north-south. The, uh, the station came out of uh, uh, Concord and went down to Framingham. And those tracks are still 
there today in the weeds. Can I ask um, you a quick question? Yes, sir. Do those railroads actually cross? They cross. Uchida? Yes, sir. They cross in what's called a diamond, and the diamond is still there in the woods. It's interesting. Oh, wow. that no particular attempt to preserve it, but the one up in West Concord was very particularly preserved in the at the West Concord train station in a very nice little sort of park. And it, uh, there's a little plaque, I think, talking about how the railroads crisscrossed each other. So yes, there was, a, there was a diamond, and hopefully the dispatchers would coordinate the trains appropriately so they didn't hit each other. And they eventually did, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> oh my. So um, let's see here. So if we were you know, looking down from an airplane uh, north to the top, this big, again, the old colony became the New Haven Railroad. Yeah. The station with that fancy turret is sitting there. The freight house is beyond that. And a little, uh, little kind of alternate freight shed and station here eventually became a little cookie business uh, in, the, uh, in the 1990s called Crumble Station. Ah. Mm -hmm. What did you say the railroad was going north and south? Um, it had two different names. Old Colony, which then became the New York, New Haven, and Hartford. All right. <coughs> Oops, sorry, a little fast. So there we are, uh, 1954, obviously the station basically boarded up. They eventually just couldn't afford to keep station agents there. There was no reason to. The conductor would sell the ticket on the train like they do today. And so the lack of uh, in, you know, freight uh, receipts and so on, um, the railroad operations diminished significantly. Uh, these stations just got boarded up and eventually, and sadly, they, many of them got taken down. So again, things like Weston and Whalen were spared. So this is one of those doodle bugs coming, uh, coming from Clinton into, uh, into South Sudbury. 1971, I call it bedtime. They would apparently take those uh, rail diesel cars and park them on a siding for the evening. Uh, and we can see this sad little <laughs> station that would become the cookie shop uh, is here. And there's the diamond with the two tracks crossing each other. And the big station is long gone. In 1971, again, was the time when the passenger service stopped. Oh. So you can look at the weeds. I mean, nobody's maintaining the tracks on either railroad. These are sort of forgotten branch lines that no one cared about. Uh, the tracks were in terrible condition. They were all wavy. You know, no one cared to repair them. They just weren't making any money. That's a bud cow. Yeah. yeah. And there, 1971, mm -hmm. sitting at the station, probably for the last time, is a bud car. And the poor little crumble station looks mm -hmm. like it ought, it's going to fall apart itself. There was indeed a crash. They took down the signals, apparently, at the very end of operations. And uh, I guess a, a New Haven engine <laughs> hit the uh, hit the Mass Central, and they had a little uh, little bump. Uh, nobody was hurt, to the best of my knowledge, I guess, except pride. And uh, at the at that point, again, that was I guess that was enough. And if anybody had any doubt, it was time to close down those two railroads. So it becomes Crumble Station, and then that closed, and it's a limousine service. And so the building is there today. It's in pretty good shape. You can see they maintained the switch and one of those nice old freight wagons, the Railway Express, and the track runs right. You can see it kind of in the weeds. There's a little bit of a track there that goes off to the diamond, which is still in the woods. Leaving South Sudbury, we'd be on our way to the Wayside Inn. Um, it didn't really have a station at the inn itself. It was uh, about a mile and a half away, but you could uh, flag it down uh, if you were a uh, customer. And I guess word would somehow get to the railroad and the train would stop. And you'd take your little wagon off into the woods there and eventually a mile and a half down would be the beautiful Wayside Inn. But a cute little, uh, cute little office there just to wait for the train to come along and uh, have your luggage out of the rain. The next thing after we would leave that wayside inn, it was known as the Why the Bunkers. Um, you could spend a whole day talking about this. In World War II, they were scared that ammunition stored in Boston on Liberty ships might get hit by a German submarine surfacing and shooting a cannon into the side of the Liberty ship, loaded with ammunition. So they decided to build a sort of ammunition depot somewhere safe outside of Boston. And they came in and they took 2,000 acres of farmland between Sudbury and Stowe. And in later years, some of you may remember, like a soldier standing guard, it was called the Fort Devens Annex. So this World War II bunker 
complex was in operation from 1942 until about 1995 when the Greater Devons Complex closed down mm -hmm. and the base was given back. Um, the Y simply represents the way the track came off of the main line and it's like an upside down Y. The steam locomotive went up into a rail yard with its ammunition. It discharged the cars loaded with you know, shells and powder and everything else. Then it backed down so it could go straight back to Boston. The problem with the locomotive is you don't want to have to back up for miles, all right? And so again, the, you kind of go up, you discharge, you go back, and now you are pointed to go back to Boston to get your next load of ammunition. And so they built this complex with 55 bunkers. And the orientation is a little strange, unfortunately. It's kind of a north, north is this way. But this was the rail line coming from South Sudbury going to out to Clinton, all right? There's the Y, so the train would go up into this rail yard. There were about eight tracks. The cars would get disconnected. The locomotive would back down and then go straight back to Boston to get the next load. And the bunker <coughs> complex was all kinds of tracks going to these big cement bunkers with big steel doors, and each bunker would have some function of storing ammunition coming out of a box car. That's, that's a heavy lo couple of heavy locomotives uh, with fuel oil for the diesel that operated at the complex and uh, cars full of ammunition behind it. And this little diesel did the work inside the yard because you didn't want a locomotive belching cinders and flames uh, you know, around ammunition. So the diesel was a safe way to, to haul those little uh, those boxcars around the yard. And that's open today occasionally if you uh, visit the complex, which is a wildlife refuge now. Uh, there's a tour given once in a while. You can check with the, uh, the folks there and see who the next tour is. <coughs> Leaving that, we go to Ordway, a little stop on uh, the back road in Hudson. And uh, we eventually pull into uh, Stowe with what they call the Gleasondale stations. It was known as Rock Bottom at mm -hmm. one point. And the problem is that there was a, a railroad coming down uh, out of Maynard, and there was the central mass. So we ended up with two stations called Gleasondale. <laughs> Confusing. This is the one today um, that is uh, part of what's known as Chestnut Street. There's a funny little bridge that goes over in a loop if you were going up into Stowe, and that was the central mass. This was the identically named station that was on the line that uh, was intended for Marlboro coming out of Maynard. So it could be a little confusing. So eventually they did join, as you can imagine, if they're getting that close to each other. And um, this, was the, uh, this was the line that's coming out of Maynard. This is the central Massachusetts bridge. And if you were to go to the Hudson Rail Trail today that they built, the ARRT as it's known, Assabet River Rail Trail, and you park right around down here in the distance, you immediately come down the trail and turn, and there's two big stone abutments. And you're kind of like, what is that? Well, by gosh, those were the abutments of this bridge built at a long diagonal that was part of the central mass line. So again, bridge long gone, the abutments are still there. And we actually see a trolley coming under the bridge. It's kind of hard to see because there was all kinds of trolley service in Hudson in those days. Hmm. So Hudson had two stations. Um, one was on the north side of town at Felton Street. The other one was downtown on Main Street. And that's where the rail trail is today, that southern, that southern trail. This is the Mass Central line from a little postcard back in the day. St. Michael's Church in the background. You can see horse and buggy. So we're, you know, it's probably about 1900 at that point. Now things are a little more modern. 1950, the station waiting area has actually been reduced, and steam operations are going to end quite soon. And there we are in 59, looking kind of sad. And it's a professional building with a dentist in there today. So the building itself is there in principle, but nothing really about it being a station, uh, as, as you'd recognize it with the waiting platform or anything like that. Okay. This was the station uh, on the south side of town, what they call the Marlboro Branch, and that's where the uh, rail trail today comes along. There's a subway 
and a shell station, and then the rail trail goes here on Porta del Vigio, I think it's called, and goes down to Marlboro Valley. And again, toward the end, all boarded up. So the Lancaster Railroad. Um, this is the curiosity of, <laughs> of interest, I'm sure, here in town, was this railroad that ran one time. <laughs> and again, part of this railroad fever. They're chartered in April of 1870. Remember that the Mass Central is chartered in 1869. So the time is right, apparently, after the Civil War to build these little railroads. Again, somebody must have thought it would make money. Um, hmm. It's a curiosity. Somebody was able to get some money to fund it, but what intent there would be and how it would make any revenue is, uh, is puzzling. Um, it started at that old boarded up station on the south side of Marlboro, yeah, I'm sorry, um, excuse me, Hudson, on the Marlboro branch. It crossed up through the middle of town in Hudson by Lamson Lumber, crosses over Cox Street, goes up into the Danforth Falls Park. And at that point today, the rail bed is very, very clear, very clear. But almost everything has been wiped out from the Danforth Falls down into Hudson. There's almost no evidence that there was anything there. There was actually, look, there's a pond in the middle of Hudson by Lamson Lumber, and apparently the railroad crossed over the pond. And again, there's no evidence of that today, to the best of my knowledge. It goes up Route 85 into the Boy Scout camp, Camp Resolute, on 495, by 495. The track is very clear inside the camp. It's a great walkway for the Boy Scouts. Then it goes to 495. When we, coming up to the winter and the leaves are all gone, if you're just about to get off in Bolton, be careful. Look off to your right and you'll see this trough in the woods. That was the rail bed dug down Okay, which was the Lancaster Railroad coming into Bolton. If you're on 495 and you're coming south, you've just gotten onto 495 at the Bolton exit, and you're going down to Berlin, again, be careful. But there's kind of a big rock cut that they made for 495. There's a big V opening. That was there for the railroad. That goes back to 1870. And that's how they got through that little granite, all right? obstacle to get the train into Bolton. Now in Bolton, it goes up to the Sawyer School, ran right behind Sawyer School, which didn't exist until 1995, and that was a trail. It was very popular when the Bolton Fair existed to go from the Bolton Fair main grounds, where they used to have the oxen pole, all right? You could see, it was like, isn't that funny that there's a trail? What was that? Well, that was the railroad, and went up to Bolton's little memorial stone house for the veterans, went across the street, Wataquatic Hill Road, and then it went on Manor Road. That's that little cut that gets you from Wataquatic to 117, okay? And the Catholic Church is right in there. At number 25, Manor Road, there's a house up on the hill, and you drive off of Manor Road across a little stream and up. That was the railroad bridge across that little stream from the 1870s, it's still there. And that's true at a couple of points uh, along Route 85. <clears throat> so the stonework survived wonderfully, and the <laughs> real craftsmanship, if you ever took the time to see you know, where these places are, boy, did they take care in those days to build something that would last. You gotta remember, steam up ones were heavy. They were, <laughs> and there was pride too in the construction. So it crosses 117 at the Bolton Catholic Church, runs along in the woods, and there used to be a camp. Um, let me see, am I going to hit a wall here on the, uh, the Crystal, Springs. Crystal Springs? Thank you, sir. Yes. Went right through Crystal Springs, conceptually, all right. crossed back over before the uh, Neshoba uh, Regional High School on 117, and went off into a big field that's there today. Right? Kind of, sort of part of the Bolton Orchards group, if you will. Goes back in the woods, toward the International Golf Course, mm -hmm. crossed Wilder Road that goes to Lancaster's East Cemetery, mm -hmm. and you'll see um, International Service Road only. Mm -hmm. Well, again, kind of funny. There's this flat grade that doesn't look natural, and that was the railroad. Mm -hmm. It then disappears down by the Lancaster DPW uh, crossing Mill Street and mm -hmm. Bolton Station Road. <laughs> kind of goes off again down Mill Street, crosses back over, and someone said to me, 
they thought that where that little medical building is, something like uh, North Country Medical by the Car Star, yeah. the railroad would have gone right through there. <coughs> there would have been a bridge across the stream at Mill Street, and then it would have cut in to the station on Mill Street. And the old freight house, of course, is still there by the Agway that was burned down a number mm -hmm. of years ago. So that, mm -hmm. that's the old freight house that was there. And there was a station at some point that is now gone. Right, so the freight house survived, the station did hmm. And so that was the linkage from the South Lancaster station <coughs> down to the Central Mass station in Hudson. So that was the route of the old, uh, the old Lancaster yes. Railroad. Let's see if we can get a picture or two of these. A friend of mine named Michael Volk in Hudson is just, he's obsessed with it. He's a wonderful guy. <laughs> he's been looking at all these points. Hmm. Um, he sent me a map where uh, I think if you click on those little teardrops, it shows you know something about the railroad right there. But essentially, we're down in Hudson here. We go up along Route 85, and again, in the winter time, you can see some very clear stretches. Uh, there's Camp Resolute. We go across like to Sawyer School, Waterquatic Hill Road, Manor Road, cross the street, come back across before the high school, the International Golf Course, okay, and down. Now again, we're going over by 110, and there we are in South Lancaster. What does the red indicate? Um, <laughs> I think it's it's actually, if I'm not mistaken, let me see. Um, boy, I don't know that he explained that to me. I know that there is a piece of property in the Bolton Assessor's office that says property of the Boston and Maine Railroad. <laughs> and it's the only piece of property that seems to be owned by the railroad and no one can figure it out. And we've written to the railroad and they say they don't know anything about it. <laughs> Isn't that odd? How much, how big is it? That, that land? Yeah. Oh, it's like, you know, uh, one tenth of an acre or something. Oh. It's yeah. a 50 foot strip, a couple hundred feet long. And how it got separated, so no one knows. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the oddest thing. <laughs> when, I cross, when I cross the Hill Street, okay, it's going down close to where we are. Okay. And that, that shed. And there used to be a sign there, it's maybe God's house, it's the, the, the fire, uh, what got the rain store. But, and it said, Fair Station. Yes, it was not, indeed. Some maps show it as Fair as opposed to the moniker of South Lancaster. Yeah, and obviously just a couple hundred feet beyond yeah. is the Lancaster Station right. on center, off Center Bridge Road. Mm -hmm. And the freight house is still there. Yeah. Uh, again, off to the north side of that. Decrepit <laughs> condition. Oh, pretty bad. There's no yeah. doubt about it. it. Really I is. don't know if you'd ever want to go in there. <laughs> um, let's see. We can. So again, if you were a real fan of uh, the details, if we were in Hudson today, this would be um, uh, this would be this subway sandwich and mm. shell station right around here on Manning Street. Uh, this is uh, this would be Broad Street. Uh, there's the rail trail that would be going down to uh, Marlboro, right? um, and this was the Lancaster Railroad. So it, it took off up up this way, crossing Cox Street, crossing over the pond. <coughs> I believe there's one known photograph of the of the trestle over the pond, and then starts up here, goes up <coughs> to the Danforth Falls, and goes up uh, what they call Lincoln Street, which is Route 85. Right, so that was the that was the Hudson connection for it. Again, you know, very little evidence of anything. There's a Marjorie Street, and there's a little bit of an embankment, and apparently that was the that was part of the the Lancaster Railroad, one of the few pieces of evidence that there was any disturbance, if you will. And you have to go to Danforth Falls to truly get the beauty of the rail bed that they laid in. Once they built all the houses on Lincoln Street, everything got, everything got wiped out. And again, we're talking 1875 and a railroad that never, never really operated. So mm -hmm. there wasn't much history to be saved, I'm sure, as people thought about that. Um, on the Lancaster end, if we can get it here, um, here we are. Uh, there's the South Lancaster Station. Yeah. There's there's Mill Street. Okay. And the railroad would have. And unfortunately, this doesn't show the railroad coming in. It's really hard to find a a, a map that's got the railroad mm -hmm. making it across the uh, across the river. But essentially, it would have come in like this, and it probably be a little closer to that, something like that. You, you can see the grade going up to the river very clearly. Okay. And on, on the river itself? If you're on the bridge okay. and you look north, 
You'll have no trouble seeing it. Okay. At private property, I would assume. Yeah. Okay. But you're on the. You know. You can see it from the bridge. Okay. So the story is that it uh, it ran one trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, apparently, the board of directors uh, were just fighting each other over reports yeah. of black eyes uh, uh, at board meetings, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> and based on some last minute research, as far as I can tell, it looked as if the tracks were finally laid and finished in October of 1873. Um, and so the assumption is that they must have made a quick check of what they had built. So the board of directors got in a, one of those old locomotives with one passenger car. They started up from Hudson, as I understand it. They were going up along Route 85, and a farmer named Nahum Stratton, who is at 258 Hudson Road today, that house is, in fact, it's kind of sad, that's all being uh, demolished uh, for some new development. He and his little daughter, Arla, are out in the field and they amazingly see this train coming hmm. along. And I guess he ran over and waved, and the engineer stopped, and they asked the board of directors could they take a ride. And they were invited in to be the only passengers, aside from the board, to ever travel on the train. And uh, so obviously up they went, out to uh, South Lancaster. I don't know if they backed, backed down or what. I don't know if they probably had a little turntable. Yeah. Who knows? It could have been. That could have been. You're right. That's, that's a good possibility. So they were the only passengers. Um, Arla would go on to some fame of being the wife of the man who created the Bolton Geranium. Uh, apparently, if you ever hear that story about the famous Bolton Geranium that sold uh, at the Historical Society in Bolton, mm -hmm. she was, became the, uh, the wife of the gentleman that discovered it in the greenhouse there. And apparently, that was, I think that was found, I thought it was found in Lancaster, interestingly enough. <laughs> How it got the moniker of, of Bolton Geranium, I'm not entirely sure. So. Um, the, they, they take one ride, there's a lawsuit that's going on, they don't have the money apparently to operate the railroad beyond that one uh, uh, trip. Um, the railroad just sits there, there's lawsuits back and forth, they run out of money, and uh, eventually the tracks are pulled up uh, you know, in 18, 1889. Uh, a director of the Fitchburg Railroad is the man who actually bought it for a song, and the story was that he bought it and of course, secretly got the money, you know, as a private individual. He apparently was really being funded by the Fitchboro Railroad. They didn't want any competition. Right. Yeah. They didn't want anybody to come and invade their territory, okay? So they just bought it up to destroy it. <laughs> and sure enough, the tracks were taken up. Yeah. I don't know of any track uh, existing. The police chief in Bolton once told me he thought he had found a rail somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I never got a chance to meet with him and walk the trails. He loved it. The story too, and I guess he must have uh, must have walked the line one day. So anyway, you do see all these pretty stone culverts all around Bolton and so on. All right, um, <laughs> we're, we're going to be way off schedule here. Um, so you <laughs> you scream at me if uh, if I'll try to move along quickly. South Bolton had a little station uh, right at the tip of Bolton. Uh, the Volkswagen uh, little Volkswagen repair shop called Beetlebug is there in the distance. Um, and that was the little Bolton freight station. The station actually became a home and was moved about a couple hundred feet down the road and is there today. So, so it, here would be about a 1974 freight coming down along Route 62 to one customer, which is called Wells Lumber in Berlin. And there was the little Berlin station. Um, the house in the background is still there. Um, that the lady is a member of the uh, Berlin uh, Trails uh, Rail Trail Committee, but sadly the, uh, the the area is open, but the station is gone. The track is still intact, and that switch is actually still intact. And there was quite a number of rails so that they could pass trains uh, at that point. Many many rails disappearing off in the woods that are even there today. Just a scene of during the winter. It's funny how open it is now. It's just yeah. trees, trees, trees. Carter's was a little station that was under the Mass uh, uh, Central Railroad um, called Carter's, and again, that was the New Haven. So that track is still operating today, and those are the trains that go up into Clinton. All right? So again, a variety of names. New York, New Haven was, was essentially the last you know, railroad before it became Conrail and CSX. That bridge is the Central Mass crossing over Carter's, and that was all taken uh, down around 19, uh, 
1960, and those bridge abutments are those ugly <coughs> stone abutments that you see today at the five corners on Route 62, either going out to the dam or uh, going up into Clinton on the back road to the Weedabix. The abutment in the center, uh, the yes, sir. left side, was in the middle of the road for many, many years, too. So oh, is that I'm right? The next one up. <laughs> All right. So there's the two of them. Would you yeah, agree? that one right there was in the middle of the road. Oh, mm. boy. <laughs> OK. And it got removed, but I can't tell you when. All right. That must have been PD traffic. So there's one of our doodle bugs. Yep. And uh, so that's, that's essentially the last point of any rails today. The rails run up to this little knoll here. There's kind of a funny V-shaped or triangular-shaped uh, stoppage. So you bolted into the tracks. And all of this is uh, long gone, the, uh, the trestle, the rails. But the, as you say, the big stone abutments are still there. Yeah. OK, I'm way off. I'm way <laughs> off here. We'll, we'll play it by ear. So um, this, again, could be like three presentations. Um, what I worked in was just because the impact of the, uh, the dam, uh, Boston needed water. And they looked around all over the place in the late 1800s. And uh, they even went up to Lake Winnipesaukee and thought they could build a pipeline down there. Well, lo and behold, the Nashua River, they decided they could dam up the Nashua River in Clinton. And that's how we got the Wachusa Dam. So they surveyed in the late 1800s. And uh, by uh, 1987, uh, they, I'm sorry, 1897, uh, things get serious. The plans take shape. They create this uh, uh, MDC, uh, Water Control District and they start building the, uh, the Wachusett uh, Reservoir and the dam to hold it. Uh, wonderful little book by a young fellow. He was 16 years old at the time, Eamon Earl. He gave a lecture at the Holder Memorial in Clinton. Uh, very comprehensive history of the building of the, uh, the Wachusett Reservoir. And again, he was only 16 years old. Very impressive uh, piece of research on his part. Um, again, a variety of, there's his book. Um, so they build the Wachusa Reservoir, and even that isn't enough. And uh, by the early 30s, uh, they're looking all the way out to the Quabbin, and they decide that even the Wachusa isn't enough to satisfy Boston's needs. And so between 38 and 47, the uh, Quabbin Reservoir is uh, built. Four towns disappear. Uh, and by 47, it is full and contains 412 billion gallons of water, uh, apparently at its capacity. <coughs> Uh, the impact of Wachusett Dam was that the Central Mass Railroad ran right through the middle of what would become the reservoir. So they had to do something about it. So they decided that they could build a tunnel through what they called the clamshell in South Clinton. And uh, then they would build a trestle right across the front of the dam and reroute the train that way instead of going south down through uh, West Boylston for a variety of reasons. So before the reservoir, okay. There's the central mass running right through what would become the reservoir itself. You can see Clamshell Pond, and that would become the target of where they would build the, uh, the tunnel. Okay, so these little stations are just a memory of what it looked like in those days. Just little country stations. Oakdale became a junction point uh, over by uh, just north of Holden, and the trains would basically disperse there going uh, either up into Clinton, down to Worcester, or out to Northampton. I call it gone with the wind. All, you know, these villages would disappear as the dam filled, and uh, they are all underwater now. So once it's built, the old railroad bed is now underwater. <laughs> At the West Berlin crossover we just talked about with those abutments, up we go above the clamshell pond. That was all new construction. They build a tunnel right here in front of Route 70. Okay. They cross over the river with this viaduct, as they called it. Yeah. They come over to where the Clinton High School would be today. Mm -hmm. And they branch at what they call the reservoir switch up into Clinton. The reservoir switch also had them go to the Clinton Junction, which got them down into Worcester and Oakdale. Yeah. Mm. And so there we are. Before the reservoir, wow. the track would go this way. Yeah. <laughs> and then after the reservoir, right, 
we're going up through the tunnel, around the reservoir, okay? and we can go up into Clinton or we can go down into uh, Boylston and Oakdale. So this was the viaduct being built. The, uh, it was the first thing they had to do. They had to get the railroad out of the middle of the reservoir first. So the first priority was build that tunnel, build the viaduct in front of what would become the dam, and get the train rerouted. Once the train was rerouted, then they could build the dam. So they <coughs> did things in stages enough that they could start the dam, they could begin to back up some of the water, but they had to get this finished first. And we just see a variety of stages of the, uh, of the viaduct being built, all this stonework. That's the far abutment over on the Clinton side of, uh, by the Clinton High School. They had to build us some uh, concrete uh, mixing plant they had to line the tunnel with it. They're looking over to where the tunnel is being built yeah. on the clamshell side. So this photograph is taken by where the Clinton High School high school would be on the <laughs> west side. Making progress. There's the tunnel entrance. Now they're digging the entrance on the, uh, the east side. Interesting picture of the tunnel being literally hand dug. It's just unbelievable the, the labor that was involved in those days. 1,100 feet long. They had to line the tunnel, and it's still open to this day. You yeah. can walk through it. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> A lot of drug paraphernalia at the entrance, so you have to be careful. Um, there again would be the uh, just about the entrance to the uh, to the tunnel. Uh, coming from uh, Berlin on the new route. Yeah. And finally, the east side is finished. Yeah. And it says, I think, 1903, if I'm not mistaken. And there we are, 1906, wow. I think it says. Is that? No, I'm sorry, 1903. Um, the workers just, you know, taking a look at their fruits of their labor uh, as it's opening. And again, the dam is still early, early under construction. Finally, we get a train, June of 1903. Now, rail operations are back in progress. And that's on the west side. So that's where most people start today. They park along Route 70, they walk up the hill, and they go into the tunnel. Then they had to build like a, a what they call the waste channel, the, if the water overflowed. Here we've got a nice little passenger train coming from the Clinton side, going into the tunnel, down, bound for Berlin. Mm. And finally, the uh, the dam is taking real shape here. Looking just about done, you can see the water starting to fill up in the background, and finally complete. Yeah. And that's taken from the dam, looking down into the town of Clinton with the nice fountains and everything. There was a generating station that was built. It generated electricity until 1955, and apparently stopped. I guess the generators wore out. They're so huge they can't be removed from the building. The building was built around them. So it's unfortunately not open to the public. I don't know if there's ever any intention to do that. But there we are, and there's the, so there's the rail um, from the viaduct going into what's known as the cut, and then Clinton High School is just beyond that, along the reservoir. So when did they, when did they take the trestle down? 1975, yeah. Yeah. a man named Mickey Fuller from Bolton uh, got a contract for it. There's a small, very rough video on YouTube of them cutting pieces of the trestle falling into the ground. Wow. And it's about 10 seconds long. And then the next 10 or 15 wow. seconds is the trestle falling into the river mm -hmm. as they make the last cut. Mm -hmm. The footings are still there in the water. You yeah. can see the yeah. footings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the but I think Fuller. I think his compensation was that he, he was able to take the steel and recycle it. Does that sound right? Scrap value? Okay. You know, what was amazing, I saw the beams on the flatbed trucks, is how deep the I-beams that were. Really? They were, <laughs> they were huge. Yeah, yeah. It totally, I'd seen it, I'd been across it, you know, in earlier years. But okay. I saw them come across the Chestnut Hill Bridge going up the hill, the, uh, those beams were 
Is they that right? Like they were 10 or 12 feet high. <laughs> now, I'm probably wrong. I don't think they were that high. Who knew? Because they couldn't have gone out of the bridges. Yeah, anyway. yeah right. That's but at the same token, it, they, it was amazing. I heard for boys in Clinton, it was something of a test of their manhood yeah, as to how far bridge. they would dive off. And I understood oh, that if you dove God. off the top, it was basically a death sentence. Oh. Oh. They used to count the trusses. I'm sure That's they right. would the crosses, they done it. They'd yes. crawl up to the first cross. That was the first notch. Right. And then you could go, I don't know if there was total three mm -hmm. to the top. Yeah. I think there were. I'm not yeah. sure. But, but you're right. I don't know how high it was in the water. Yeah. So did the boys in Lancaster do it too? Is that what you said? I heard of people who <laughs> never saw it. Because you grew up in Lancaster. <laughs> <laughs> when, when was the last train you used to go across the Trussell, do you know? Right. Um, the, the last steam engine was number 1455, and that survives today at Danbury Railway Museum, the New England Railway wow. Museum. That was in May of 1956. Thereafter, for two years, the bud cars, the silver bud cars, ran very few, obviously, you know, very limited passenger service from 56 until May of 58. In May of 58, everybody in Berlin was told that this was going to be the end of operations, and apparently, uh, in Reverend Crackhart's book of uh, the history of Berlin, on like May 13th, um, the bud car came into Berlin, all kinds of kids and families loaded into the car, and they made that last trip through the clamshell, through the tunnel, across the viaduct, and then they discharged in Clinton. All the parents had to drive the kids back. They, what they called deadheaded, the empty car from Clinton back through the tunnel, empty, and may have parked it in Sudbury for the night. Uh -huh. And so that May of 58 was the very last uh, passenger service, wow. and, and, and including freight that I'm aware of, that went into Clinton. Mm -hmm. There were diesel haul trains near the end of the line. Oh, uh, yeah. so little, like switchers? Oh, that's uh, interesting. I've never seen a picture of the diesels. Okay. Wow. Oh, you'll have to. I'd love to talk there's to you not, about that. There's not <laughs> a lot more. Okay. <laughs> okay, I've only seen one or two. All right. And I was unable to tell you here. So All right. From Interesting. But there were diesel all trains. Okay. Well, you can imagine yeah. passenger service was down to almost nothing, oh, nothing. Yeah. by 58. And I think they were running one train a day. I have a question. It might be no. too, too complicated no, this sorry. presentation. It just seems to me when they were building the dam, I did not know the railroad went underneath. I mean, yeah. the reservoir. Right. It seems to me so expensive to reroute the railroad and build a tunnel. I mean, all I can remember is the big dig. And I agree. Of course, not, not on that scale, but right. how expensive and it all ballooned out I totally it. agree with that. Out of, okay. out of control. I think that there was a significant amount of politics involved, yeah, much like us. Oh, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. Because, because, you know, that's right. Yeah. And it was, but, all, it was but, all public money, too, wasn't it? All yes. state money? Yeah. Right. I'm talking about politics with the railroad. Okay. And because the thing is, uh, I could have rerouted that whole thing. Mm -hmm. No track building at all by coming up to the New Haven line to Clinton. Could have gone to Air, come oh. up to Lancaster. Because I would imagine what it had to do was upgrade right. the change that was already there. Yes, I would imagine the people that own the railroad were pissed off that they're going to put a reservoir <laughs> on the railroad. <laughs> so to get cooperation, they right. told me they would reroute it, reroute it for them. I suppose that was again. Kind of it's it's it was the Boston and Maine at yeah. that point. Remember yeah. that one factor. Yeah. They're they're almost going to gain control. They've got the majority of shares. They've got right. the money. When the whole thing was started, okay. it was <coughs> not in the late 1900s. That's when the Boston and Maine became the Boston and Maine. Okay. And when it bought up the Boston and Lowell and Fitchburg right. and everything else, and it was excessive competition and uh, fear of the unknown. We have a name for that, but I can't think of it. Sorry. Right. <laughs> um, and I think when that whole thing got started. It was started with one railroad, and by the time it got done, it was a different railroad. Mm. And, you know, there was... Yeah, politics. I recently okay. read something that talked about using the Lancaster and Hudson Railroad as a bypass for that, too. But, obviously, that never happened. Right. Because the roadbed was there. Yes. And would have done the same thing, mm. too. So, when the Central Mass book was produced hmm. okay. in 1975. There was a quarterly publication by the Boston and Maine Historical Society. 
And in 1982, one of the issues, there was a thing called what we forgot when we wrote the Central oh. Massachusetts <laughs> <Yeah>. Railroad. <laughs> and it contained all kinds of interesting wow. extra pictures that were not in the book. And there was this errata of information we didn't get right. Okay? They thought that the steam engine in Clinton was the very last steam operation on the entire Boston and Maine Railroad. It wasn't. That was May. In July, somebody dragged out an engine in Marblehead and did a little operation of pulling a couple of cars for whatever reason, they fired up an old steam engine. And that became the last, what they call, revenue run, in other words, on the books run, of a steam engine on the Boston and Maine Railroad. So Clinton almost had it. Wow. It, it's documented as, I think, being, I think being Marblehead, and I can show you that at some point. I'm not going to Just, Just what I read. The errata also contained a line saying, in 1895, the citizens of Bolton considered uh, the Lancaster Railroad as being the answer to the rerouting of the railroad from Hudson around through town on the Lancaster line to avoid needing the clamshell tunnel and the viaduct. But there's no explanation about it at all. And I've looked at the selectmen's records in Bolton. Mm. And I can't find anything more than that one line. So I don't know where the Boston and Maine historical people yeah. ever got that information. But it, it would have seemed to do it. Now, of course, it would change the whole nature of Bolton like crazy if that amount of rail traffic had I gone knew through in those days. So, <laughs> exactly. So I agree. There's probably something political that somebody oh, yeah. made some money off it. Yeah, sure. So yep. who knows? <laughs> you know, I could tell you something else about that viaduct that maybe people don't understand. No is along the viaduct, every X number of feet, there was a little square platform. Yes. That was three foot square approximately. Okay. Well, the young guys used to like to know when the train was coming, they'd run out on the trestle oh my and God. stand on oh it, <laughs> and the train would be going probably this far and far. And plus, I imagine the whole thing shook like mad. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my <Because> God. <laughs> I, knew, I knew people that did that. I mean, really? You know, water barrel. I, you know, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I thought the squares would have been if somebody happened to be on the bridge fixing that's the That's why they were designed. That's, right. that's yeah. why, to my knowledge, that's why they were designed. But the, the kids used to use them just for, for a okay. big kick out. Right. 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 Oh, my God. That's your wife. <laughs> So much, so much history, isn't it? This is incredible. Oh, wow. So anyway, here we are. <laughs> We're trying to get to Northampton. <laughs> we, uh, we crossed the viaduct, and today this red outline is the big Clinton High School and Junior High School yep. complex. Yep. Uh, again, no evidence exists at all that anything you know, went through the middle here. But there was a switch point where you could go into Clinton, you yep. could go down to Worcester. Uh, and that was called the uh, reservoir switch, and then it was a Clinton uh -huh. junction over here uh, that would get you again routed either up to Clinton or down, depending upon your direction. And so the Central Mass indeed was able to get up into Clinton via that uh, that switch point. And so this was the Clinton <laughs> junction. Again, it's the south southwest side of Clinton. Okay, and here we are in on uh, in, in Clinton. And at that wow. point, they called it the Worcester, Nashua, and Portland Railroad. And that's actually what ran right here through Lancaster. That was the, it wasn't the central mass coming through Lancaster, it was this WNP. And then that went up through Air, went through Groton, where the rail trail is today, the famous Nashua River Rail Trail, went obviously to Nashua, Rochester, New Hampshire, and finally to Portland. So busy day on the turntable. Yeah, there's a train ready to go, uh, one of the 1400s, and you can see one of the doodle bugs just taking it easy. Mm -hmm. What would you say about a 19, it's funny, it looks like about a 1948-something yeah. yeah. uh, automobile. Where's that? That's, that's where McDonald's is. Where is it? Where were we on the turntable? Wow. The, where, where, where oh, was sure. the, the turntables, as, as they say, uh, near the McDonald's, the rail bed, you've got the McDonald's, you've got the current rail yep. bed today, mm -hmm. and there's a number of big warehouses behind I there. Exactly mm -hmm. the go for it. <laughs> if you go to Flag Street in Clinton, okay. the road dead ends. At where and it was looking at what is now the CVS, <coughs> and the turntable was just beside that north of it. Wow. Mm -hmm. And the hole was oh, there some time ago. Okay. Well, you can tell, um, we all know where CVS is. So. Yeah. And yeah. then we can take a picture. It's been worked because of the <laughs> additions of the warehouse. Okay. 
But before that, I believe the pit was still there. Probably makes sense. And yep. it, it's not as far up as McDonald's. Okay. It's more where the CVS. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Like yeah. Like that Flag Street. And yes. Yeah. Flag and Street. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. here's our little fair station. Yeah. Um, hmm. It actually says, I believe, if we stare hard enough, South Lancaster on it. But you're right. Many maps show it as as fair. And so uh, that, I believe, would be the freight house that's still there today, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. And this would be the station that is long gone. Mm. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about the orientation. Um, if, if, assuming that's the railroad, are we looking, are we, are we going down Mill Street Extension toward 110 South at this point? is at the top, I believe. OK. And the Santa Bridge Road. This That's should be Mill Street, Street as far as I know. Street. Mill, Mill Street. Street. Yeah, right. Correct. Correct. The next one we'll see mm -hmm. is Lancaster, and that's, I think, Center Bridge Road is right in there. Yeah. I believe that would be the freight station that's there today, and yeah. this is long gone. And that's the... Yeah. Yeah, because their yeah. Thayer station in World War I, Colonel John Thayer had the troops come out, and they would assemble and march up into the New England forest area and do bivouacking. One of our past commissioners had found these big holes in the ground and they were thinking they were indigenous. Yeah. But it turned out they were bunker wow. holes where the soldiers wow. would dig in yeah. and replicate what they were going to face overseas. Yeah. So Thayer got, I think, got the name attached to it because the Thayers were very I big into railroad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't it funny, that too, that the station is so close up together. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't be a quarter mile, something like that. Wow. So from a justification see. standpoint, it almost hmm. had the markings of a private station, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. So we're, we're a little, we're, there's a little bit of a diversion again, just because you know, you're the right audience. Um, <laughs> if we left the uh, Lancaster station, our next stop would be Still River Depot, uh, yeah. again, which is long gone. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, uh, you know, that little, that area leads down to the National River uh, where they have the uh, Oxbow Wildlife Refuge parking lot. And the sign for the Still River Depot is up at Mr. Uh, oh, uh, Willard's vegetable stand right there on 110, if you're ever interested. Okay. So if we were just, again, this is what the station looked like in Still River. There's our train going back to Lancaster. <coughs> Well, so, <laughs> yes. Was yeah. that the um, route where there was that famous um, train um, accident or something where there was? There was a, a very bad huge, accident. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, in, oh, yeah. We have a right? picture of it in the. Is library. that right? Yeah. yeah. I I've got it wow. in my my. It's it's part of the presentation, but again, I just didn't want to drown you in Harvard oh. stuff. The Harvard ah. people went crazy oh, about it, right. and so we did a whole still river. Harvard and air. <laughs> yeah. So this presentation is like a monster. It just keeps yeah. growing. Up. <laughs> I'm trying to tune it to the right audience. I'll <laughs> be glad to. <laughs> All righty. Note to management. Oh my gosh. So let's see. So at this point, again, we're we're coming to the end of the line. I, honestly, um, the funny thing is, we're only 36 miles from Boston, and we have to go 104 miles out to Northampton. So we're just going to rock it through all these cute little country stations here. Those, these are the mile markers. Yeah. Oakdale, there again, big diamonds, all kinds of railroads crossing at that point. Wow. Nothing, nothing left, nothing, it's all, it's all gone. There's kind of a little park there at this point. Quinnipoxit. Hmm. Yeah. Jefferson, yeah. there were two stations in Jefferson, one for the Fitchburg Railroad and one for the Central Massachusetts. <laughs> Mushapog. These all stations, they closed basically during the Depression, uh, 1932, 35, <coughs> 38. Even West Rutland, it's amazing. The line broke during the hurricane of 38. Yeah. It was a big washout. Wow. Um, for, for short money, they could have fixed it. They decided not to. I think the amount was $25,000. And that was enough to say, no. no, we're not going to spend it. <laughs> we're just going to let it die. So at that point, the railroad went from Northampton to Colebrook, and then you went from basically like Rutland to Boston. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that was the end of it. 1938, that was the end of the through traffic 
all the way out to uh, Northampton. It's wow. said that when Calvin Coolidge was governor of Massachusetts, he would have taken the Central Mass Railroad from Northampton all the way to Boston. I don't know how frequently, but uh, apparently that's where he would be if he wanted to spend four hours. I guess, right? <laughs> Good thing he was president. Nice big trestle in Bondsville, kind of looking like the, uh, the one in Clinton. Yes, the other in Town. Oh, that was Who did they know that? Just a different view. And finally, Northampton. And that was, that was the station unique to the Central Mass. Then they decided to uh, uh, build a union station for several railroads, and that became the new one. That became a union station as the tracks uh, converged from Boston and Much Army. bigger. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> that's just a that's just <laughs> figure of speech. So, it, it died because, again, passenger service, you know, uh, uh, was hurt by automobiles. Uh, freight traffic went way down. The Depression had a huge impact. 1932, they actually end passenger service end to end because of the Depression. The hurricane comes and Cobra mm. becomes the failure point. Um, they, uh, they create these two different divisions. They stop passenger service to Marlboro even before the war. Um, it did help, of course, that they had the, uh, the railroad for the, the Sudbury bunkers and all the ammunition. But there was no revival after World War II. It, uh, it, was, it was really in bad shape. The tracks just looked terrible. Uh, no one put any money into it. And the B&M itself filed for bankruptcy in 71. That was their sort of first chapter 11. Uh, I believe they finally went uh, down for the count in 1983. And what they called Guilford Rail, which has renamed itself to Pan Am Railways. The guy actually bought the logo of the Pan Am airplane globe and the colors, and you'll see now engines that say Pan American huh. Railways, mm -hmm. Pan Am Railways. Mm -hmm. um, so the Guilford, the big G of Guilford has largely disappeared. Yeah, but they are the new, they are the inheritors of B&M. So mm -hmm. anything that the B&M owned, Guilford Rail owns yeah. at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about the last service. Uh, the New England Railway Museum is where the old 1455 went. Um, May 58, the last passenger service in Berlin. Um, they demolished that bridge in 1960 at the West Berlin crossover of the two, uh, leaving only the stone abutment as a, as a memory yeah. of it. Um, Hudson, the last passenger service, 1965. And then finally in South Sudbury, we saw that sad looking RDC and that little, uh, that little uh, cookie house in November of 71. So freight service continued for a few years again almost just singular uh, you know, trips with a single box car for like a lumber company. Colwell Lumber in Berlin was really about the only customer they had going all the way out on the central mass wow. at that point. There was a wedding train. Uh, a man paid about $15,000 to, uh, to lease a steam locomotive and uh, three fancy cars for his daughter's wedding. Hmm. I believe they got it out of the Bellows Falls uh, Railway Museum that was up in Vermont which eventually would go down to Steamtown in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, so this is old 1455. It was at Edaville for many years, if you ever took your kids down there. And then it got moved, went to uh, Cape Cod Railroad for a while, and finally ended up out in Danbury. This is the wedding train coming out of Vermont. So there we are in Boston. Oh, yeah. Hmm. yeah. And uh, I think we're roughly about Wayland at this point. So they took the little trip to uh, Wayland. And I believe the, uh, uh, there's two different stories I've seen. One said the uh, reception was at the Wayside Inn. Another one said it was at the Sheridan Tara down in Framingham. So at that point, the buses came. All the guests got out of the train. Seems like an expensive, very short train trip. Uh, I've talked to different people that say they can remember hearing a steam whistle. You know, in the, uh, it looks to me like the fall, doesn't it? Uh, or the uh, early winter. You never heard talk, a story about that? I saw that during You did? Oh, wow. And I don't remember there being any bus thing. Okay. Huh. Um, and I don't remember any story about going to Framingham or whatever. I, um, as far as I know, they, I mean, the train is loaded up with guests and they oh, have to do something with it. it was loaded and it went <laughs> west. And then okay. It went back. All right. Uh, and it was a steam, it, the, the tender said Steamtown right on it. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I can't even see it, but I know what it says. Yeah. I think we have some pictures of the. the, the You've museum. never talked Sorry. to anybody. At one point, I had some pictures of the uh, 
the cars. No, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, again, it's, it's limited, but they had these beautiful, yeah, they had these beautiful passenger cars. There you go. Did you make the famous? Yeah. Oh, we got to talk. Okay. <laughs> so, indeed, the, uh, the very last passenger trip that I'm no, aware of was four of these Bud RBCs in October of 73. And apparently they did quite a huge circuit on all the old yes. branch lines, including the Central Mass. Yes. And they ended up in Berlin, as I've heard it, um, where the old depot was. But I guess after that, the B&M, it's almost like the trip got kind of snuck in by somebody. And I guess the railroad management said, this is too dangerous to have uh, passengers on our I these old tracks. I remember they ran the bud cars until there was no track left, and that was at Colburn Road, I think. Oh, was, there you go. Um, exactly right. And the abutments were still there then, and then they got removed and oh, all right. degraded. Okay. Uh, but I believe they went as far as the, the track went. That's exactly the right. Ancient. Colburn Road is the last. Yeah. And apparently that's where the MBTA lease ends. So in terms of a rail trail. there was trail, no rail after that. Right, exactly. There was no bridge. Exactly. There's um, nothing left. You know, so that would that would have been a fascinating trip, I would think. Right? We, we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, That'd okay. be wonderful. So that was the last passenger trip. Uh, there's a picture of it crossing 128, taken from somebody probably up on Bear Hill in Waltham. That's that big high hill with all the microwaves. And uh, these again are the last, the very, very last, the last freight to Berlin, Hudson, Sudbury, and uh, apparently a crew took a little renegade trip with their. Uh, <laughs> Your diesel out to that famous bar lunch in Hudson, if you remember that. That's now, that's gone, unfortunately. And it's the uh, Hudson Appliance has moved into their space. But I guess they love bar lunch and they, uh, they took a secret trip. And the reason I know is a friend of mine uh, in Hudson is obsessed with the Central Mass history. And uh, he actually went into the bar lunch and wanted to talk to the guys. And they were like, you don't see us. <laughs> We're not here. We're not here. Oh, That's exactly right. Wow. That's not oh boy. Not us. So, so September 1980, that was it. That it was uh, formally abandoned at that point, and uh, no, uh, no, no trips uh, beyond that. Oh. And there's certainly, again, the condition of the track is such that I don't, I don't know how far anybody would have even gone in Waltham, and for what reason. There it probably was the absolute end. There's many places through the center of Hudson where there's still railing. Yes, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yes. Yes, sir? If uh, my memory serves, in 76, 1976, the Freedom Train rolled through town. Or oh, right. tracks. Oh, by our house. Yeah. Yeah, it went by, by our house. Wow. Steve. Mm -hmm. well, well, so where about? Here in Lancaster? Yeah. On well, yeah, right before the Clinton line. Yeah, South Lancaster. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Going up to air then. Uh, that no, no, was that coming from here? Yes, no, they were coming through Lancaster into Clinton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. They had the, the, the caboose car yeah. all painted yeah. up and people yeah. you know, throwing yeah. Boy. flags. Yeah. So where are the photographs of that? Clinton Island or something, maybe? That, that, would yeah. would be yeah. that would be it a good place east. to start. Okay. Through Hoosick Tunnel. Yes, all right. And I don't know where it went after that. Jeez. But if, if you check the thing of the All right. training, you'll have no trouble knowing where it went. Okay. It's not easy to go from North Korea and Hawaii from any fire. Yes. I don't remember. I just remember the train coming through. Would the, you know, would the central mass ever be a rail trail? Well, the answer is yes, that, that there's a lot of activity right now. It seems to have this formal name of the Wayside Rail Trail. Um, and yet there's also websites called centralmassrailtrail.com. I believe I have a map here for you. Um, so Waltham is, is uh, they're, they're apparently they're clearing the track in Waltham. Weston finally uh, came on board. And again, that's all paved at this point, thanks to Eversource. Um, Wayland, they've paved the uh, route as well for a bike trail. Um, and I guess there's some controversy right now in Sudbury about Eversource wanting to bury those lines that we see in the photographs, the overhead towers, and I guess it's a big stink on environmental impact, and I don't know where that's going. Burying them is a big stink? Burying them, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. I guess I don't quite understand. I don't understand either, it's a, but it's a big hot issue in Sudbury. If we wanted Sudbury. to put poles up, we'd say, oh, we can't do that, but I, I saw it. I understand. <laughs> so, so the answer is, we just don't want it. It's a lot of NIMBY stuff. Yeah. There was even oh, yeah. a, a, a study done in 1995 on reviving the Central Mass as a commuter railroad. And apparently Sudbury 
was the NIMBY. It was like, no, we don't want any noisy trains coming through our backyard. And for short money, apparently it could have been revived, and it was it was sunk. Uh, and the political rep in Boston was um, uh, was threatened with her position if she pushed. <coughs> I believe someday there's going to be a giant commuter lot at 495 in Route 62. <coughs> It may be 50 years Who from knows? now. Who knows? <laughs> Tear up the rail trail and... It'll, I think that's why they're there. <laughs> you wonder, don't you? I, I don't think there's any wonder to it. <laughs> okay. If we pave it and have people walk on it, we can put the rail back. There was even talk <laughs> of having a bus route instead of a railroad line. Yeah. So apparently that's done in some countries. They put buses on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so as we wrap up, finally, the, uh, the famous... <coughs> Central Mass for you dedicated fans. Wow. This is the book. It's absolutely <coughs> wonderful. It's about 40 some odd dollars. Um, it's, it's on Amazon. It's sold at the gift shop over at that uh, bunker. Uh, the Sudbury Bunkers, that again, it's a national wildlife refuge now. There's a nice little store in there. They have uh, a little diorama of HO trains showing what the little engine was like that took the, uh, the boxcars around. Is it uh, No, it's beyond, it's beyond that um, going east. It's the Hudson Main Street, the unnumbered Hudson Main Street, 62 branches oh, off. Okay. Okay. And if you're on that back road, which is Hudson Main Street, which begins at 62, don't branch off to the north. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to stow. Stay on that Main Street. All right. The state has a big fire academy. Have you ever? Does that yeah. ring a bell to anyone? Yeah. The State yeah. Fire Academy, right past it, it's, oh, that's yeah. where the wildlife refuge is. They have a sandwich board out yeah. that says this is the program of the week or the program of the month. Yeah. And you turn in, you take about a half a mile drive down a beautiful road, and there's a gorgeous visitor center there where, again, nice gift shop, they have all kinds of presentations, and you'd have information about seeing those bunkers if you're ever interested it's in that tour. <laughs> Um, so these are just different people I've contacted over the years. Uh, again, very helpful in helping me with my presentation. I got all the gory details from this Mr. Humphrey on your fan trip, yes. huh? including what they had for lunch. So wow. he must have had a very good diary. Uh, I can't remember lunch. I'll, I'll tell but you all I about it. We couldn't afford the lunch. Okay, fair enough. Because the ticket was like eighteen dollars. Oh, or big, big money. <laughs> Um, a man named Chuck Fisk, he and his son hiked the entire line back in 1988, and that, that journey and trip wow. is all documented. Um, more currently on YouTube, this fellow, if you search on this JPH0917, he and his partner have walked the entire 104 miles, mm -hmm. and there are 15 video segments, about half an hour each, of their literally walking the entire line. You can see what it looks like today, you know, abandoned stations, switches, crossings, the weeds, everything else. So it's fascinating the time that people have taken to, uh, to you know, bring this to you instead of you getting out in the, uh, in the rain. So I'm very grateful for these, these videos that exist. Um, that's the caboose, you know, in, in Hudson on the, uh, on the rail trail. That's part of the, uh, Mar what they call the Marlboro Line that came off the Central Mass. And uh, I thank you for... Uh, your attention yeah. so much. It's uh, again way way over time. Thank you. <laughs> Someone emailed in about train whistles. Trains. How would they find out the different sounds of the whistles? Do you have any clue to send them to, or just Google it? So you know, like any musical instrument, the it's the cut uh, in the in the steam in the valve, right? <coughs> that and the pressure that's going to determine the tone of the whistle. So European whistles had historically been very shrill, uh, very, very high-pitched shrill. American whistles had tended to be quite low, and they vary from one to another. I know that there's a famous engine from the Norfolk and Western, uh, and boy, does that have a low, kind of ominous yeah. whistle. It's really something when you hear it coming. Are you talking about the pitch or the arrangement I'm of the I'm trying to say someone emailed yeah. the society and asked about right. how do they find out about the differences in whistles. Well, you just yeah. answered it. Yes. I, I know. She's talking oh. about the signaling of it. No. no the man sound. wants to know oh, the pitch, yeah, the, the tone. Oh. Oh. Right. No, I, Sir. Know, I know every oh. engine has a different pitched yeah. With whistle. 
Is that right? Mm. <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> All different. <laughs> okay. Every inch at a different one. Well, okay. And you can tell what that you heard. Okay, but down the track, you do one inch at a time. Is that right? Could have pulled that jazz yeah, no idea. Yeah. Now, there was a man who approached me at the last lecture, and he said, would you like to hear what the engine sounded like? And I was like, what do you mean? He said, in 1954, yeah. he said, I got a generator and an old reel-to-reel -reel tape oh recorder. God. And he said he worked at Raytheon, down on Route 20, at that Russell's Crossing. And he was determined to get an <coughs> audio clip of the engine. And he got his generator, he got his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and he sent me a little clip of it. And what was surprising was how fast the cycle rate. I would have thought it would have been, you know, choo, 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 choo. No, it's like So fast, you can hardly, it's amazing how much and how cyclical it was coming down the track crossing Route 20. Um, and it's, it's only about 30 seconds. Uh, if anybody's interested, you can send me an email um, and I'd be glad to send it to you. It's a little MP3 audio file. But he was that interested in recording the audio history of that, that engine coming through where he worked down in, down in Raytheon. That was quite an effort to drag all that equipment out in 1954. Uh, apparently not. <laughs> not on a big reel-to-reel -reel tape deck. No. No, he's way back. Who knew, right? So easy to pick up on the Yes, sir. So, so I'm the guy who asked about the whistles. Oh, fantastic. The cameras are like this big. Okay, did we? Is there any more we could do? Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So the other question I had in that email was, um, there are two different train lines, yeah. I think, that run through the right now, right? I could hear them. One on one side and yeah. one on the other one. Yes. The one at the bottom of Guadaquatic Hill coming down from from Bolton. That's right. Which line, what line so is So it's CSX, and <coughs> the one that comes out of Northborough goes through the old five corners where we talked about what was yeah. called Carter yeah. Station and the abutments and so on. Um, goes up along that back road to Clinton, and I think that is the one that crosses over High Street, if I'm not mistaken, oh, on that trestle. On oh, the High Bridge trestle. The, right, yeah. on High Street. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. And you yeah. see cars and sitting there. Down it comes down over Water and High. <coughs> there you go. And it, and it goes over the cement bridge over Main Street. It comes right up my highway. There you go. Rhode Island. Okay. Wow. But where is it? Where is it heading? Where is it going? Uh, oh, isn't it Pratt's Junction? Yeah, it goes to Pratt's Junction. In, in which is Lemonster. Okay. 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 No, it's Lemonster. Okay. It goes into Sterling. Okay. Sterling. The tracks pull. All right. Is, is, Close to the line. Does anyone know what, what they're carrying or who, the, who they're well, servicing? One of their, well, they, they, one in Lancaster, well, maybe it's, it's on Lancaster, the Sterling line. They serve the pressure treated place. They used to serve okay. ag oh, yeah. by the ice cream bar. Yeah. Yeah. That's gone. I don't, they go up there all the time, every day almost, to the pressure treated. At least I yeah. believe they do. They carry a lot of Is that right? Okay. Then there's the train coming from Worcester, right, that goes through Clinton. At the wire factory in the old depot, oh, yeah. goes by McDonald's. Yep. yep. Right. Okay. So that's the one that's here. This is right here. That's the Boston 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 Okay. And goes to Air. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So one yeah. goes to Air go North. The, the other one kind of goes right. West Sterling. to Prince Junction yeah. and Sterling yeah. and yeah. Lemonster. Right. And those are the two yeah. two lines. Yeah. And I guess they're both CSX Corporation. I think. Which kind of owns everything. I always hear Boston Maine that they. I think they run six trains a day. All right, Pan Am. North and South own the line. Okay. And they must lease it for CSX. CSX All right. is definitely for a certain amount yeah. of yeah. Okay. The bond cost. Yeah. Is it? Okay. I know there's a CSX sign that says that the signal is out of operation. On the one on Water Aquatic Hill, it actually says call CSX company 1 800 if this signaling equipment has failed. One of the top is not middle. I don't want to hold people prisoner. You've been more than generous in yeah. staying here. Thank you so much. I'm sure there's some wonderful refreshments. Uh, if you please approach me if you have specific questions, I'd be happy to stay as long as you wish.
in our collections here in town, we have a spike from the line. Oh, is that right? Ran through here, oh, and God. just recently we oh. were given, I just can't believe it, the Lancaster Station sign. Oh, oh boy, that is wow. so, you know, it is mm -hmm. in great, great <laughs> condition. So at some point in time, it you will be exhibited. Oh. That's wonderful. Yeah. That. I've seen them on eBay for like $500,000. That's how bad it is. And yet one's stolen. It's terrible, isn't it? I know. Probably, yeah. I mean, this was in a barn for many, many years. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so our next program will be Saturday, November 18th at 1.30. And it's going to be, the speaker's going to be Terry Ngano. And we're going to go over to the Clinton Historical Society at Holder Memorial and uh, have a joint meeting with them and seeing the connection between Lancaster and Clinton should be very, very interesting and please come. Well, there's plenty of connections.